Everybody, welcome back to the Woodworking Workshops. My name's Colwyn Way, Woodworking Wisdom Workshops even. My name's Colwyn Way. I've got Ben on the cameras and doing all the uh, question asking for us today. And today's one of your requests. So we're looking at another wood turning project. Um, and this one is the um, Basket Illusion uh, Bowl. It says illusion because it is only an illusion. It's solid timber. Um, but what we're going to try and do is talk you through it. This is my first time I've ever done one of these. Um, or second time, actually, because we've just done one to um, trial um, and to give Ben something to decorate so we can get pictures to you before we actually make the thing. So let's have a quick look, Ben, at um, the basket illusion. I guess number two to start us off with. There we are. That's our, our allu basket illusion. So what we're supposed to be producing is something that looks like it's been woven as opposed to um, a solid piece of timber. That's our finished side. This is the work in progress, which I'm not going to spoil for Ben yet. Um, Ben's going to go over this tomorrow. Remember, this is a two-part project. So I'm doing the turning today. Ben's going to do all the pretty bits, all the colouring in and, and the relaxing bits and bobs with the pottery pen and colour and all that sort of stuff. Let's have a flick through those cameras. Well, I think it's sort of a spiralling effect there with just because that's the chosen pattern that, uh, um, that, that Ben's used. But no, pretty old um, a bit of turning this one, some proper decoration. You, there, there, there are loads of um, uh, instances online where you can get some inspiration as to different uh, patterns um, and, uh, and things. Also, Ben is going to go over how we actually create uh, these patterns and the grid that we use. Um, and there's all sorts of, of different variations on there. So Ben's going to go over that tomorrow. I'm going to do the, the the dirty bits, as in the turning and the sanding and all that sort of thing now, and then we'll do a handover just to make it easier for you. Like I say, this is my first go and Ben's first go at doing one of these. So, um, you know, anybody should be able to pick this up and just play. It looks more complicated than it is. It's fairly simple, uh, really. So let's make the bowl and line it out. Now, there's a few little bits and bobs that we're going to um, talk about, a few um, ways of creating the patterns, a um, few little things we've made up, and also the actual tools. Now, we're going to start right at the beginning. The best tool to use for this instance would be a fluted parting tool. I don't possess one. I don't own one. And as a company, Axe Minister, we don't sell one. So I'm going to put that out there straight away. There's alternatives um, that I'm going to use. But Robert Sorby do one. Um, if you wanted to go the fluid parting tool um, way, Robert Sorby are your, your people in the UK. Um, I'm sure if you look online in the US and other countries, then you'll be able to find a source for a fluid parting tool. However, um, my alternative, I'm, I'm going to use one of my... Um, ring forming tools so this particular one is a six millimeter uh, ring forming tool and i've just ground it so i've ground it so there are no um, edges left on it so it's an actual um uh, an arc there and that's six mil okay um i think i'm going to do a few more of these because i really like them and i'm going to go a little bit bigger in terms of bowl size but smaller in terms of bead size because I think we can get some really fine um, decoration going. But this is my start. Six mils is worked. And I think that bowl in particular, if I just get it again and show you the back of it, I think it's, it's certainly um, it's, it's a great start uh, and, and certainly inspired me to have a go at a few more. Like I say, this is one of your inspirations, uh, one of your um, uh, suggestions that we do these. Um, so I'm really chuffed that we that you've given us a suggestion. We can have a go ourselves. They are, well, so far, they are really, really good fun to do. Uh, quite relaxing as well. Once you get past that turning point, you know, and you actually start working out, working the grid out and so on and the colouring, it's quite relaxing. But we're back to bowl turning, just to start us off at least. We've got a few angles. You can see I brought in a camera really, really close. So when it comes to um, marking out and, and deciding where we're going to go grid, Grid-wise, um, you can see exactly what we're doing. I'm going to be utilizing the indexing system on this machine. Um, now, we've gone with a 72-line um, uh, pattern. The reason being that this is a 36-indexed um, uh, lathe. So it doesn't, you know, it's not that much mass just to double that to 72. But if you go, um, you know, if I only stuck at 36, the 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 squares that we get at the end of it would be too big and it wouldn't look as intricate. So 72 has worked really well for us. But you can go onwards and upwards from that, you know, um, do the, the multiplication as long as you have some way of indexing. But I'm literally just utilizing the index that's on the lathe and just doing an extra turn in the chuck 
Um, so we'll show you that. It just means I don't have to invest in a lot of other equipment um, also. Um, so let's just get turning. I have a specific size, and the size I've got here is 22 millimeters. Um, so in terms of uh, Imperial, that's about eight and three quarters. That's what the size I'm using, only because I wanted to show you the um, button jaws as well. We're going to reverse this onto a set of button jaws to take off the foot. So I've used um, things like the push plates before, um, and I've used wood plate jaws. I thought, oh, let's give you a show on a set of button jaws, and I'll explain those as we get into the end of the project. There's going to be some sanding. Um, there's going to be, hopefully, some little tips and tricks that you may not have picked up so far in any of the, the demonstrations. Um, and, of course, you've got to ask questions. Ben's here to ask me the questions that you ask. more questions we get, the better, um, because that's the more information we can get across as well so let's start the lay so learn lay speed to zero turn the lathe on before i do that we're going to ask her ask answer even our first question from ben so there's a couple of comments here colin about people's wood turning magazine showing up this morning so they've been you you've been looking up at them from the doorstep, <laughs> from the doorstep? <laughs> oh um, great i haven't got one yet so brilliant well done <laughs> good stuff um, so this is from Paul. He's just um, he's starting off a new career as as a wood turner. He's, um, uh, do you have any advice for someone starting on that journey? Uh, yeah, lots of advice, actually. I mean, um, depends on the country you are, depends on where you are. And don't rely purely on selling your pieces. It doesn't. Uh, uh, many wood turners out there that have just relied on that won't stay um, wood turning for very long because it's a hard graph just to sell work unless you find that right area um uh things like etsy of course as well as galleries as well as your craft shows craft fairs and craft shows are always a good way to start off get you some honest feedback from the general public um and uh i would say look to be able to to demonstrate when you're competent enough and confident enough and craft shows live demonstrations at craft shows are great for that because it builds your confidence up but no demonstrations um talks on the subject writing if you can get into writing those sorts of things they are all bits to help you along the way don't rely on one source of income if you're going pro um so yeah that's the best advice i can give i think be confident 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 and uh, well confident in your own abilities that's the, uh, always a good way to start and try different things experiment don't be afraid Okay, let's turn the front face off. Just going to raise my hand up just to stop my um, myself getting covered in shavings. It's just a habit I got into, really. So, the timber that I'm using here is a piece of sycamore. If I'm honest with you, and I always am, if I'm honest with you, the piece of timber is a good choice, but in this case, not brilliant, because the sycamore... Sycamore is a lovely white timber. It's great to decorate in colour. Um, but the issue with this particular sycamore, there's the, it's been down for a while. So there's soft patches in it. So there's a little bit of tearing when, I, when I'm scraping, which essentially um, the tool that we use to create these beads is going to be scraping. Um, so there is a bit of, a bit of uh, work to do after I've actually done the tooling, just, so, um, just to make Ben's life a little bit easier with the decorating. Um, but that, you know, that's, that's part of timber, isn't it? It can't always get... Uh, amazing timber and it's not an excuse because we'll still make it work i'm hoping there we are making sure nothing's touching the tool rest lay speed's good i'm happy with that i've got four screws in the in the face plate all we're doing there is just making this round and i'm going to measure again i want to be like i say that 22 mil or eight and three quarters um, and I think I've got a fair way to go yet. Yeah, we're, we're well over nine at the moment. So let's take a little bit more away. Let's have another check. Size is quite important for the jaws I'm going to finish this piece with later. So, um, yeah, I've got to be a little bit careful that I don't go too big. So one more cut and we're there. I 
I'm sure there's lots of you that have given this basket weave bowl a go. Um, and if you haven't, it's a, it's a really nice little project. You can do this a couple of nights, I would have thought, to be fair, um, or a weekend. You can get some nice work done. I would I'd start off on something like this, this sort of size, if I'm honest with you, and you can progress up. I, like I say, I'm already inspired to give another one a go, but go bigger and go smaller on the beads. Um, really, really quite uh, a nice piece to make. I'm going to use the C jaws to hold a sacrificial foot just here, and then I can start shaping. I'm not going to use a whole um, thickness either, far too thick for the shape that I want, because this is going to be fairly flat in terms of a, um, a bowl, almost like a plate sort of thing. Um, so I want to use external part of the C jaw, sorry, internal part of the C jaw to hold. So foot needs to be that big. There we are. You may have read or seen a bit about Chris Fisher um, in the turning press uh, recently. He's done a couple of really good interviews in the national um, press. One of his um, little inventions, the speed sizer, I use it all the time just for getting sizes of jaws quickly on sets of dividers and things like that. So a really useful bit of kit. Yes, Ben. Um, so the measurement you gave, was it 222 millimetres? Did I say 22 millimetres? 22 millimetres. <laughs> 22 centimetres or 220 millimetres, my apologies, which converts in uh, in old money to eight and three quarter inches. Yeah, my apologies about that. 220 millimeters. Yes. And from Pete, he's saying he's got a few sets of jaws on their own mounting jaws. Um, does he need to grease them? If there's sawdust on them, will that cause problem in the spiral? Uh, no, don't need to grease them. Um, they absolutely, if you grease them, what you tend to find is you get lots of gunk build up inside and then they'll need cleaning. I never grease them and never open the back up to put extra grease in. Keep it sealed. That graphite grease will stay inside. Um, and if you put anything on the um, outside of the chuck, it'll just spray off and end up hitting your timber and you. So, so keep it um, free of grease, definitely. Um, brush it off if there's any on there at the moment. And then James is um, he's having a go at a uh, staining a vase yeah. um, with spirit stain, but he's having trouble getting the last few sanding marks out, which they're, they're really showing up. Um, have you got any tips? Power sand. Power sand with 400 grit and then go over it with a 600. So you generally find that the, the scratches that you see are from an earlier stage. Uh, there's in one of the sort of coarse to medium stages. So if you mix up your sanding, hand sanding, power sanding, you'll get rid of those scratches. So if you do like a 400 grit power sand, 600 grit hand sand at the end, you should get rid of those uh, those little telltale scratches. You should. You've got to, got to keep trying. Okay, let's just um, do our foot. So I've measured that to fit the C jaws. I don't know. Don't need to go to a very deep foot on here. Two to three mil is, is okay. Only because the C jaw has a small uh, gripping area anyway. And then I'm just going to back some of this waste timber out the way. There we are. So a couple of things I've done here. This one, sacrificial foot. This one is the true base. So this will be the base. I'm going to clean it up in a minute. And then just a little flick. I like to have a little shadow line just here. Um, it's nothing to grip, just a little shadow line. And then we can pull away from there on in. There we are. Let's just have a, a tidy up. I'm going to use the skew first. Just tied up the inside of that that little recess. Sorry, that little foot, and then the flat of the skew just to clean up. 
And we'll come back. We'll take that away um, later on with a set of button jaws. I don't need to worry about putting a dent in the middle um, like I have done before when I'm using a push bait. It's not necessary on here. So right then, let's have a look at shape. We're, to be honest, we're almost there with the shape. Remember, this is going to be like a plate shape. So let's get the bevel rub in. And I'm going to do a little bit of sanding. Just because I know that this sycamore is a little bit woolly. A little bit woolly. So what it'll probably do is this tear in a couple of places. It's not too bad, if I'm honest. I'm still going to do a little bit of sanding, though. So let's go. Um, I'm just going to do a sheer cut where I can't quite get the bevel rubbing near the foot there. So I'm just presenting the bowl gouge almost like a skew, really, on that little area. And it produces those lovely little shavings, real woolly, wispy shavings. Um, and then we can move. Move to the outer edge. I don't want any blemishes there. I think that would be all right. Let's, have, let's just stop and have a look a minute. We can, one more thing I want to do, actually, before I sand that. I'm going to round this edge over. This is a basket weave bow. I don't want any sharp edges there at all. So let's come just around with that edge. There we are. An annoying knock develop on my lathe for some reason. There we are. So a quick bit of sanding, and then we'll start decorating. Won't need much. I'm just going to go over it with a couple of coarse grades, um, and that should be enough. Then. So dust extractor is going to go on. Not too fast. I don't want to create a lot of a lot of dust. Dust extractor is on, but even so, I want to help the extractor out by not going too fast. So this is a hundred grit. I'm going right up to that little sacrificial, sorry, not sacrificial, that little shadow line. And we'll just stop and have a look, make sure all tears and nasties have disappeared. Yeah, pretty happy with that. So let's go to 150. So we were referring right at the beginning, um, having a bit of a laugh about the Wood Sony magazine. This come out this month or was due to go on sale 27th. The viewer that pre-ordered have got yours early. Um, I'm lucky enough to be one of the guest editors um, on this issue. There's an interview in there with Helen Bailey, fantastic Turner from Newcastle. So um, yeah, grab a copy. It's a little bit about myself and my family and working together in wood turning. That's Wood Turning Magazine. There we are. So I think now well, let's just go with a bit of rotary sanding. So what have we got here? I think I'll go with a 180. One eighty grit. Just speed the lathe up a little bit.
There we are, that'll do us, I think. Right, okay, let's get our marks in. So I'm not going to mark right the way to the bottom and right the way to the rim because what I want to produce is a band top and bottom. If I go back to this one here, it gives us that, that, that really nice effect, you know, that band on the outside edge. You can, of course, go right the way to the top, absolutely no problem at all, but I'm going to leave this band here and down the bottom. Yes, Ben, got a question. Um, so it's about the ticking of the lathe. Um, Bill's just asking, was it... Um, was it a piece hitting the tool rest? No, no, no. It's been, I built, if I'm honest, I need to go inside and uh, have a look. It's something to do with the belt there. I suspect between myself and Jason over the past couple of days, uh, we just need to get inside and, and check the pulleys, that's all. Uh, it'll be all right for the next one, honestly. Um, I know that only because I can make it worse and I can stop it quite quickly, you see. So I just need to check that. Turn that lace feet down a little bit. Yes, yeah, another question, Ben. And Robert would like to know, um, what kind of angle would you recommend on the long grind bowl gouge? A long grind bowl gouge, probably about 45, if I'm, if I'm honest. If it's not, if, if you're talking, um, let's say you wanted to go for a spindle um, detail gouge, then I'd probably go right the way down to 40. But 45 is, is pretty good um, on, a, on a long grind. Um, I tend to go with 55. It's... Um, it's more an Irish grind, 55 degrees, um, and it's an all-rounder, you know, not too aggressive either. But 45 on a long grind, yeah. So, look, here's the um, the scrape. All we're going to do is start, let's give myself a rim of around about half an inch, 12 mil there. We'll do a similar thing down here, um, but we'll end up wherever the scraper takes me. Nice and flat on the tool rest, um, and lift the handle so I'm above the um the cutting height with my handle and remember this is a bead forming tool so it's got a nice uh a round on the edge however i have had to sharpen the edge the faces of the edge because there would have been a um a much wider profile than i need so i'm just sharpen those into points what i mean by that is these two points da -da -da -da. there we are these two points here they're really quite um sharp and just take your time especially when you get to that final part of the cut because the more you press the more you tear This is a quarter inch, a six mil beading tool. This is the crown one. And to sharpen these, as I know we're gonna get that question in a minute. To sharpen these, um, Pop the diamond card on the top and sharpen the top edge. Don't mess around with that front profile. Really important on this. That profile shouldn't change. So we've got to sharpen the top edge, not anything around here at all. Yes, Ben? So we've um, got a couple of questions here. First one from Frederick. Um, he has the bowl sander, but he finds he can't remove the heads. Um they they're jammed in is there a cure for this other than brute force not that i know of no, no, very briefly a minute let me just turn this one off um you can get this on camera they are literally held in with um with friction so it's the friction on here into the center of the bearing so that is it it's just a, a case of push on and pull off so if they're stuck, I don't know. Bring it with you when I see you on the, I think I'm going to see you on the 5th, Frederick, up at Sittingbourne, hopefully. Bring it with you. I'll have a look for you. Yes, Ben. 
Um, so I think you've just answered uh, Gunther's question about lapping the tool on the top. Yeah. Um, now, Chris is asking, uh, what's the tool rest site for the feeding cut? I'm cutting on about center point. Yep. So the tool rest is a fraction below. And I'm cutting, aiming to cut on that center height. Keep them coming, Ben. Um, so Hodgepodge has heard a rumour on um, Pat Carroll's Meet the Woodcutter uh, uh, on Sunday. Um, do you kiss the robust lave? <laughs> Say that again. So he's got me giggling. He said, do you uh, kiss the robust lave when you leave? <laughs> yes. <laughs> And then a question from uh, Benjamin, or Benjamin. Um, <laughs> do, does the long milled groove on the Axminster wood turning button jaws um, serve any purpose? No, but it should. I mean, Jason have mentioned it before, um, a way of utilizing that groove because it's there. I think it's the, the, the manufacturing process was the reason it's there. Um, but no, it, uh, at this point, it doesn't have a, a reason. Um, we want to make some use for it. Um, but yeah, at the moment, no. Well observed. Just softening this edge, and I'll soften that last edge. Little bit of abrasive in there, only for the reason that I said to you earlier for. It's a little bit um, woolly dry dead and all i'm going to do be careful with this and grab your paper because you've got quite a severe groove so you know let your paper go if it wants to there we are and what i'll do here we'll see what time we got to just uh, how much i do because i think for you to sit and watch me do all these lines might be a bit of a waste of your time, but I want to get to the inside as well. You might have to just sit and watch me do that front face for me to turn it over. I will be as quick as I can. There we are, 150. Two forty. So remember these these beads are six mil. So and you can go a lot smaller, of course. do us quite happy with that so there's our line so how many have i got one two three four five six seven, eight nine lines there not that that makes a huge amount of difference unless unless you're pre-planning the the um the pattern that you're going to put on it because if you're pre-planning obviously you're going to have a set amount of lines um and a set amount of divisions as well so um ben uh, as a part spoiler, a spoiler for your tomorrow demo. What was the grid? What was the website? Can you remember off the top of your head? What were they called? 
If not, we'll find it tomorrow. No, yeah, I think we're going to have to find that. We're going to find it tomorrow. Yeah. But there's a particular website you can go to which pre plans the grids for you. Like I said, we're using uh, 72 um, positions. Um, but you can multiply that by uh, sets of 12, so or have less if you want to. So there's a great little website, and uh, we'll give you that information tomorrow. Um, so what am I doing? Right, now we need to divide up. So what I'm going to do, take that out, get rid of the, the tourist in the minute. Now, you remember me um, talking about and using pretty much for the last couple of years our um, sanding table. And the sanding table is just a bit of um, high-density fiberboard. So like that, and we had, sorry, that's that's me old one, I'll just, as you can see, I've just taken the screws out, and we had this, we had a setup with our little plate, um, a stop collar, and a tool post in it, okay? All I've done is just change that for this, and I've just made a little kidney shape, basically, um, a kidney shape that I can use on the outside of the bowl, just to sort of half guide myself around that curve, and then again for the inside of the bowl when it comes to doing the internal curve. So very, very quick and simple to make. I did roughly sand the outside edge as well just to finish it off. Um, and I've also set it to um, for the pencils that we're about to use to, to actually mark on center. This is a really important thing. You have to mark in the same position no matter which um, uh, how many lines you put on. Uh, and what I say, by, what I mean by that is, that, you know, my lathe will stop at 36 positions. I then need to physically move my face plate because I'm not using an indexing plate on the bowl. So to do that, I need to position it um, just by moving um, uh, the faceplate there. If I then moved where I was with the pencil on my um, board in terms of its height, it would ascribe an uneven line. So that pencil does need to be on the very center point of your bowl. So let's get nice and close. Horrible noise. Um, so look, let me turn that lathe on a minute. And just put a pencil mark on centre line or centre point. You can see how high above we are um, with this. Oh, let me tighten that up. You can see how high we are. If I just used a pencil there, it's far too low. Um, there's nothing stopping me from just doing that. But I wanted a little bit of a flatter surface. So all I've done is drilled a hole in a bit of timber um, and done that. That now meets onto centre point. Yes, Ben. Gives me something a bit. Bigger to grab onto, nice flat surface, and I can scribe nicely. Yes, Ben, sorry. Um, so Dominic would like to know, what would your take on uh, using acrylic paint on bowls instead of spirit stains? Um, acrylic, no, absolutely no problem at all. My only um, thing with acrylic paints is they take a bit longer to dry, that's all. Um, I think they also raise the grain a little bit more as well. So that would be my only reason for not wanting to use them over spirit. There we are. So we're ready to start marking. I have 90, uh, what did I say? 72 positions to make. So I'm going to do this really quickly. So here we go. So there's my centre point. I've locked my my um, indexing pin up. You can't see it. It's the back of the lathe here. So now all I'm going to do is scribe. And again, I know there's going to be lots of people out there saying, well, why don't you use the pyrography unit in here held in its own bit of timber so you can mark directly? Well, because that will give nothing for Ben to do tomorrow is the honest answer. Um, no, it's me. I was here experimenting. I'm playing with the, the lathe and marking out. I've got a pencil. That's how I'm doing it. And then Ben's thing is the pyrography unit. So he's going to do that separately um, tomorrow. No, nothing clever in it at all. It's just that uh, my time was doing this. Now I'm going to just keep going and trying to think of something to say. So if you've got questions whilst I'm doing this, this is fantastic time to start asking them. And look, if you miss one of your marks, it doesn't matter. You'll see, look, I've already missed one. So let's get that to where I think it should be, roughly, and find the locating point and mark it out. Because we're not marking directly on the timber, it makes no odds anyway. Find the next hole, mark, next hole, mark. I'm doing this super quickly. I would usually take a lot more time over this. Just shout questions out as they come, Ben, then I don't have to look up. Um, so Martin's saying, um, it would, oh, sorry, Chris is asking that um, it'd be good to see the process of moving the indexer if possible. Um, he says he appreciate it might be difficult with the fixed cameras.
give me give me a couple of seconds. A couple of seconds. Let's do a few of these. And also, while while you're um, busy there, Colwyn, the um, the the lathe. Where are we? AC three seventy. Um, so the the log base craft one. Now, the the spindle doesn't come out of the back of the um, of the machine. Is there any way of um, can you modify the lathe so that you'd have um, a, a plastic disc cover where the hand wheel would be um, on the cowling for the pulleys? Sorry, that's quite a long question. <laughs> <laughs> what are you asking me? <laughs> so on this one, yeah. There's no um, spindle on the back. Yeah. Is there a way you can kind of hand crank it over without, um, do you have to modify the lathe? I think, if I'm honest, I think so, yeah. Um, it'll have to be, because it's a... Um, they're spanner fed, aren't they? So it'd have to be. I know you've got a spanner to to use to actually. Um, what's the word I'm looking for? To lock the lathe up, as it were. So yeah, there's no way I would. I can think of the. There was a version of them um, that. Oh, it's about ten years old now, I suppose. That um, that actually had a hand wheel. But no, unfortunately, these haven't. I'm missing one of these areas. Let me try and find. Yeah, look at that. Got it. Uh, no, there is no way I know of. I'm, I'm afraid. And would this be possible? This um, from uh, Frederick. Uh, would it be possible if you don't have indexing? Um. Um, if you don't have indexing on the lathe, Frederick, then there are numerous things out there to put indexing um, on lathes, on chucks, you know, indexing plates, that sort of thing. Or go online and look and make your, your um, one up yourself. Bit of MDF, back of the chuck, for instance. Maybe that could be something we could look at as a future how-to, how to create some simple indexing yourself. But we're getting there. We're getting there. And then Hodgepodge is asking um, if he missed it. Did you burn the surf circum <laughs> circumferential? <laughs> I know what you mean. The circles going around. Circles going around. Yeah, yeah, I know. <laughs> no, I haven't done them yet. I'm going to do them in a minute. I've got uh, a neat little trick for you that with yeah, that. Cool. I've tried a few things on that as well, and and with some disastrous um, results. So we'll go over a few of those. <laughs> and then I've got a couple more here, Colin. Um, from Jim, what's the point of the masking tape on the spindle uh, with the reference to indexing? That's a little cheap for me, really, because my indexing is back here. I'm focused here, and I've just put some oh, 12 divisions around the outside just to get make life a little bit easier for myself um, and for you guys so I'm not um, continuously straining around the back of the piece to find out where the numbers are. Um, for your question, Martin, um, probably worth sending that into our um, Woodworking Wisdom um, at, at axminster.com, um, and we can give you a bit more of a full answer on that one. Um, Bill's asking, why don't you double the size of your kidney top so you can scribe both sides in one go? Well, that's a good question that I have never even thought of. That would make life a lot quicker, probably about, times by about two, wouldn't it? <laughs> I honestly have never thought of that, but now I feel really stupid. <laughs> Excellent suggestion. There, everybody. Benjamin is um, is asking, are you a Babinga or an Ash Man? Uh, I think I'm an Ash Man, if I'm honest. And the Timbo's a Sycamore. That's for Vic. Bit of Sicky, yeah, bit of Sycamore. Just scrolling down through, Cole. We've got a few here. Um, when you made the platform, did you use a spirit level to ensure that it's perfectly flat, or does it not matter too much? This one? Yeah. No, this literally just the plate screwed on to it. The, the plate screwed on. It doesn't matter. Um, it's going to be flat, whatever. 
it's being engineered. It's it's um it's like an MDF, so it's going to be really accurate, or as accurate as we need it to be, anyway. And then Trevor's asking, what's the small hole on the tool rest? Is it part of the manufacturing process? It is. It's used for when they're dipped and just hung up, powder coated, all those sorts of things. You'll find them on on several different. Um, tool rest some for the dipping some for the powder coating depends on what the quality um, of the tool rest is there we are so look i think let me just double check make sure i haven't missed anything because we're going to go and do the same thing again now no i haven't that's that's we're nice and equal all the way around now that's 36 lines i want 72 if you had an indexing plate with loads and loads of lines it's easy you just move to your next position. I haven't. I've only got 36 lines. So I'm going to simply eyeball it. So if I make, if I just look at one of these marks, let's say, right, there's my position. You can measure it. Obviously, be far more accurate than I'm doing there. Then if I position that, okay, find a, a position on the indexing right there. I'm going to under, I've got grub screws on the side of my, um, faceplate. So all I'm going to do, hang on, let me just slacken this off a little. Right, back him off. Then I'm going to engage. Engage the Next, where's my mark? There's my mark. So there. So what I'm going to do, look, I'm just going to move it into position. And I've gone the wrong way. There it is. So that's my, I'm indexed in. I'm locked in on my index side. I'm going to bring the bowl around until I meet my pencil mark. And then I'm just simply going to tighten back up again, being careful not to go too tight. Now, remember, it's the grub screws on the faceplate I'm working with. Back off, go to the other side. Double check that by going back to my mark. There we are, and thy, my indexing should lock in, and it does. So that means that now that's nice and secure. I can carry on. And this time, look, we've got our indexing points smack bang in the middle of the last and what i'm going to do is follow that fantastic bit of advice bring that over oh, it doesn't quite work the other side oh yes it does sorry it's me No, it's not big enough. I'm going to have to come back here. But that was a good bit of advice. Do one big enough to spam both sides. Yes, Ben. Yeah, just keep firing away. Yeah. <clears throat> Excuse me. Paul would like to know, um, if you could have an endless supply of any wood, uh, what would you choose? If it was good quality, probably you or walnut. <laughs> And that would be very, very different to something that Jason would pick for his box making. I know that for a fact. But mine, for the type of things I do, you will walnut. Sycamore, I suppose. But I can get a sycamore fairly easily. Um, or burr. burr. I love burr oak and things like that. Any type of burr or burls, um, which, of course, used to be discarded. It used to be known as discards. But now every timber, timber yard is cottoned on to the fact that they're actually quite valuable. 
And um, Hodgepodge said you could use this um, to give your smokers puffer played puffer jackets. <laughs> yeah, you could do. You could do. I did use this sort of decoration. Um, is in the beaded decoration for the robot arms and legs, if you remember, on the smokers. And if anybody's interested, me and Finley are working on the next book. The next book is on smokers. That should be out, I would say, probably in about three months. Um, Jim B actually guessed that it would be walnut, so um, yeah. he's fishing for a prize. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we're speeding up now. Yeah, we're sorry about that uh, question there, Martin. Um, yeah, pop it into our woodworking wisdom at axminster.com and we'll um, we'll give you a proper answer for that this again is i know it's difficult to ask a question it's also difficult to answer without um you know showing you the, the different bits and bobs um so dominic's daughter wants to wants him to turn her a bread bowl um what wood would you suggest Cohen? um but a beach uh, sycamore um tulip is another good one it's big and uh, big in size and um food safe Ooh, that's probably ash maybe just be aware that it will it's not the best for chopping or cutting on it does split and tear quite badly but um yeah if you can get it you can get it in big sizes maple's another good one a little bit harder than the sycamore though and Bill wants to know what's your um your book going to be called? Oh no, this one is literally just on the smokers. So I've done one already, which was uh, on wooden fruit making. That's um, we do those downloads and the hard copies. But we're also looking at a much bigger one, as you know. My passion is all things. Um, I'm not going to say let's say festive period, <laughs> but German inspired Seifen and the All Mountain. So smokers are, are my take on them, and. Yeah, should be, like I say, next sort of three months, we should be looking at getting that one out there. That'll be on the website. Um, Paul hasn't... Um, he can't get a bead former. Um, could he use a diamond carbide scraper? Um, could you use that to form the beads and then um, take the skew to it to form the beads... Would that be too dangerous? I suppose you could, if you set, let's say, for instance, you use a set of dividers to work out where everything should go and then put a V cut in, yeah, with a, with a carbide and then just feather around with a skew. I, I would have thought, but leave the skew flat as a scraper. I wouldn't try and um, form in the conventional way only because the grain's running in a different direction than it would be for bead forming on a piece of spindle work, for instance. Grain will grab the skew if you're rolling in that conventional way if you wanted to do it on here i'd probably go more spindle gouge and, and form that way but just use the skew on its side and, and scrape that around after creating a v-cut with your carbide um that would work there hopefully if we can get nice and close with that one ben you should see all those now 72 lines running around the outside edge so that takes a, a fair bit of time we've got to do the same on the inside but i'm not going to make you sit and and watch me do that um, all I'm going to do now is turn that one over. Oh, no, I'm not. What am I talking about? So we want those, what lines are they called, going around the bowl bin? Don't ask me. <laughs> They're free to start, though. I'm not going to try. So, yeah, those lines. Now, there's all sorts of ways you can do this. On a piece of spindle turning, it's much easier because you can hold things over the top of it. I have seen, you know, things like piano wires and stuff like that used. I get a bit nervous with that. Uh, in case it wraps around fingers and all those sorts of things. So if I'm asking students to do it on a course or anything like that, we either go with uh, a bit of formica or uh, wooden wedges. Wooden wedges are, are far um, easier to use, safer, and um, and you can cut as many as you, you need from scrap bits of timber. Be aware they make smoke. You are creating friction here uh, when you're making these lines. So um, just watch for combustible material underneath the lathe 
but also fire alarms and things like that. I'm going to have dust extraction going, taking away as much dust, uh, smoke as I can um, and keep my fingers crossed as well. So here you go. So a little wedge, wooden wedge. Okay, and all we're going to do is use that wooden wedge um, and into the, the lines that uh, we've already cut and they're going to create a nice black mark, hopefully. So we want lane speed wants to be up a little bit. Ben, could you go to number four? Just so I can show people as it happens. There we are. If we start, let's start in the middle. So look, there's the wedge. We're just going to shove it into one of those lines until you see black arrive. There you go. Already you can see it picking up. So it's nice and nice and easy. So it's just picking out those little individual um, lines that you've created. Ben will, of course, do the other lines. These lines going into the center that are, at the moment are already on, on pencil. So let's take that one off the lathe. Now, don't forget, I've already done grub screws up here. So I'm going to make sure the grub screws are undone. And we can take that one off and then hopefully you can see what we have in terms of those lines both into the central center and the radial lines i think it just come into my head then ben radial lines around the outside all right let's take faceplate off yes um, so Dominic's got two two-inch thick bowl blanks. Um, would he be able to glue them together to make a four-inch bowl blank? I'd be very nervous, if I'm honest, to get them to to stick. You're taking a lot of material out. You create a lot of pressure. Um, there is potential that the join will be very thin by the time you finish. I would buy a four-inch bowl blank. I'm honest. I'm not being um, sarcastic when I say that. I, I literally mean that. Um, there is a big potential for that to explode whilst you're turning it um, and you'll be in the way. So no, I wouldn't. I'd strongly advise against it. And then Copper Owl wood turning. would like to know, are you using a new wedge for each each line? I, don't, I used uh, uh, one wedge on about two lines. Um, so as long as, because what they do, they actually, they wear away quite quickly and then the line becomes less crisp and obviously a lot broader. So yeah, I, I, you know, every, every other I swap them out. And Bill's asking, um, could you have knived the radial lines uh, rather than use a pencil? No, well, with the pyrography, you know, yes, with the pyrography, absolutely you could. You could use a sharp implement, yes, um, as long as it stayed flat and it didn't follow, follow the grain of the timber. That's the only other thing um, you can get, especially if you're carving it. Sometimes it'll follow the grain. So, um, but yeah, if you wanted to go straight on with a prog in it, you could do that, of course, and just burn them straight away. There we are. So let's just do a little bit more turning now. I'm going to put the C chuck or C jaws on and put the SK114 chuck. We'll take the inside out. And we'll make the beads and we'll stop there. I'll finish it and Ben can pick it up tomorrow with the decoration. So at the moment, far too wide. So we'll just take away some of that depth. There we are. So start by taking away the depth. I'm just going to lose... Because we're taking away a lot of timber, I'm just going to put the dust extraction on just to save mine and Ben's lungs a bit.
Ah, oh, so now let's just stop the lathe. We'll go get a little bit closer. Start the shape. I don't want to go too thin because don't forget we've got grooves on one side. We're going to do the same on the other. I don't want to end up coming through. So. So this is this is one of those um, jobs where you can't just go away, have a cup of tea, and come back halfway through like this. Not only does timber move when you are um, when it's drying, but also when you're releasing a lot of pressure like this, it will start springing. So we've got to pretty much finish this one straight away. Certainly in terms of the turning, anyway. I'm already getting movement. Yes, Ben. So we, we've got a few questions about the um, about the amount of material that came off. Then, um, the first one's from uh, Bill. He's asking, what size bowl gouge are you using to remove so much material? This is a, a 3.8, so a um, 9 mil uh, bowl gouge. And that was the one that you were taking those um, stepped cuts with? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, I, I pre-prepped two gouges, both nice and sharp before starting, um, both the same size, just so it saved me going away and sharpening one to continue. That was all. Um, Jenny's asking, could you not have started with a thinner blank in absolutely. the first place to save the wastage? Yeah, absolutely. It's what I had to, ha had to hand. I bought a two-inch um, board, so 50 mil board, um, and I've been using it for lots of projects. Um, I just needed something a little bit pale. I thought sycamore would be the best one, and that was the only thickness that I had. Um, so I had nothing else to th you know, thin enough um, to do the project. And Cliff's asking, why go with the steps rather than a pull cut from the centre? Um, just speed and tidiness, really. I knew that I wanted to um, do this in stages here because of the vibration that it could cause. So um, that took that away nice and quickly. Because we were cutting the side grain, um, I didn't have a, uh, you know as much likelihood of it breaking out as I came off the edge also. Um, and it's just, yeah, just for me, a bit quicker attacking that, that true side grain. There we are. Now we'll just skim across the bottom. If you wanted to here. You could put a little rose in the middle so you could leave this proud a little bit higher. Or decorate the center. But I, I'm not, I don't think I'm going to. I'm just going to go straight across the bottom. And the reason I say that is what we don't want to be doing is using that basket effect to go all the way into the center. Because you imagine 72 lines, by the time they get to the center point, they're, they're just a mass. There are massive lines, and for certainly for Ben, for decorating, it would be almost uh, impossible. And there's a little bit of a gravy bump in the middle. Let's get rid of that.
So uh, you'll probably all get this when I say I'm looking with my hands before I look with my eyes because the eyes can be deceiving. Your fingers can pick up little lumps and bumps before, uh, even though your eyes might think it's nice and flat. That's actually okay. I'm happy with that. I'm going to stick with that. What that needs now is a good sand, um, and then we'll start putting our lines back on there again. But what I'd like to do now before we take this off um, is I'm going to show you how we would reverse this. So my next job, you won't see me do this because this is going to be all ready for Ben to decorate tomorrow. Um, but I'm going to sand this from 100 to 150 to about 240. Then I'm going to put my lines in that I put with the the um, bead forming tool. I've done that on the back. I showed you that already. Then we'll do our burnt lines, the rotary burnt lines, um, and then another sanding. And then it's the next bit. I want to turn it over and take away the foot before I give it to Ben to decorate. So let me just show you that. Whilst I set that up, Ben's going to ask me another question. Mm -hmm. So I've got a couple here. Um, well, Hodgepodge is saying he's, um, I think he's got some experience with the with the basket weaves. Um, and he's saying some people like to do three or four beads at a time from the, from the outside of the rim. And then that helps with the warpage as it as it goes oh i see do that before this is taken out good idea there we are um no absolutely because you've got more of a solid core um stops that chatter and then bill's um asking about the gravy bump what's a gravy bump gravy bump is the little lump in the middle of the bowl um all wood turners get it from time to time so it's a raise um and so it's taking that lump away so you've got either a nice convex or a nice flat base whichever you want and then this from Frederick, um, is it always better to remove the centre or the outside of the wood first to relieve the stresses in the wood? Go with your outside first because otherwise you have no idea where or how close you are to the bottom of the bowl. It's good to be able to pinch as you go, um, you know, so you can feel the thickness of the piece. Unlike pottery, of course, when you see them get going from the centre out. Um, no, we're definitely sat outside the centre. Um, one thing I haven't um, spoken about there you know when we were doing this side we moved it on the face plate when you're doing the inside you can physically just slacken the chuck away and twist that bowl around to suit your next position so in terms of going between 36 to the 72 you just twist it um, one of those calibrations and then lock it back up again and do the other you know, 36 lines all right so yes another one ben <laughs> so bill wants to know why why gravy though I don't know. Well, I'm guessing you, you know, you've got your dinner plate. When you've got your, your, your plate full of gravy, you see that little island in the middle. It's a gravy bump. I don't know where I got it from. I've just always known it as a gravy bump. Right. Let's say all those little um, beads have been done. I've marked it. I've done that other 72 um, uh movements on the chunk which i'm not going to put you through again we're then going to go i can finish the bowl then because ben doesn't need to put it back on the lathe so i'll put my button jaws on you've seen me use push plates before you've seen me use um wood plate jaws but this is just another option for you if you've got these already or if you're you know you're looking for something to be able to take the back of the bowl away let's say this is finished that goes back in in the chuck there we are. And then all we need to do then is lock that up. Those lovely little soft rubber buttons support the rim of the bowl, leaving you free, leaving you free then to take out the sacrificial foot. So that will disappear. You can then sand it up. And that's exactly what I've done with this one. That was in there. Clean the bottom up, ready for, for putting your name on. Okay, let's another question, Ben. Um, yes. James is asking. Um, would you offset the basket weave lines on the inside um, and the outside so it doesn't get too thin, I guess, where the two beads? Yeah, it might be a wise idea. It depends on how thin you have gone with the bowl, of course. Um, but, yeah, it wouldn't be such a silly idea to do that. Um, the, I was listening to Jason earlier. Ben said that uh, in a conversation it's, it's always wise to have them, to make it true basket illusion, to look as though that is a solid bead running all the way through the bowl so in that case then the the lines would be in line with each other you know um, but to be fair 
you'd struggle to see if they are in a different place because they are on different sides. So absolutely go with the thickness that you already had. So there we are. So before we go, any questions? Because there's a huge amount of, conf not confusion, but it, it sounded complicated to me, let alone uh, anybody that has never done it before. Um, this is my second one, by the way. I will say that again. <laughs> Um, make excuses before we go anywhere. Any more questions, Ben? Um, so Jenny would like to know, would the foot be flat or slightly indented? It's very slightly um, concave, yes. Very, very slightly indented, just to stop it potentially rocking around. Because don't forget, if we turn it dead flat now, who says it won't move a little bit, absorb moisture or dry out a little bit more, you know, so it could change a little bit shape-wise, so it might rock otherwise. So, yeah, a very slightly um, concave. Okay. Well, there we are. So we're going to, or I'm going to, finish this one um, to, tomorrow and uh, then hand that over to Ben. Ben's going to carry on the decorating and uh, and show you tomorrow what, what it's all about. So I hope you enjoyed that, everybody. Um, once again, my name's been Colin Wade. Don't forget, if you like what we do here for Woodworking Wisdom, give us a thumbs up, share around as much as you can, subscribe to the channel, suggest us to everybody you can. Um, it, we really enjoy this, but it does count on you guys watching and giving us suggestions like this. This is your idea. So thanks again, and uh, Ben, I'll see you again tomorrow. So bye-bye.